So then after the BTOP conference, uh, you didn't see your oncologist in person anymore each month because things were going quite well. So how did you keep in touch with your oncologist then? Yeah, so uh, thanks Lise. Uh, this is the seventh episode and we're just about up to date uh, with the project just about to be launched. So the, um, yeah, so the oncologist didn't need to be face to face. I needed to get blood still done and the, it, here in Cambridge we have both the hospital itself and also a park and ride where you can just turn up and, and queue for a while. So that worked fine. So both times we just had a call, both in uh, August and I think in early September. Uh, okay, and um, that was successful? You were able to discuss yeah, they, everything with him and he just made a new prescription out and that was that for the next month? Exactly, yes. It was yeah. really just to check whether, whether it had any side effects or whether the blood showed anything. Uh, and in fact, uh, I'm going away now, or we're going away for a couple of months. He doesn't even need, or six, seven weeks. We do, he doesn't even need the blood during that time. So at the moment, I'm in a very luckily stable state. Mm. And that also means you were having some uh, more headspace to think about, uh, for instance, starting up this project. Is that right? Yeah, so it's around about then, probably in August time, I suddenly thought perhaps I, I could give something back to others. And uh, obviously, like any startup inverted commas I needed to work out whether it's the right thing to do so there are a number of things I talked to um, colleagues and friends and uh, even even my oncologist about it things like you know what what um, what was the content going to be what's different there's plenty of other uh, cancer journey podcasts and blogs out there who are the audience you know what um, what can I teach or help people with that other people aren't doing so I spent a long time thinking about this and in the end I decided I just don't know who the audience are. I'm just going to have to hope that uh, I've got some ideas, as, as I said in the introductory vlog that we did. But I've got some ideas, but I just had to hope that it will just grow. So it's the content will be, as you've probably seen if you listen to these, it'll be my approach, my data and research approach to um, cancer, how I've worked together with the NHS and the health service, etc. Um, and so I just decided to, at that point to at least put together a, a plan and then gradually over the next couple of months get that plan to the point where we could launch it, which um, I'm hoping to do later today. Mm -hmm. um, so then at the end of September, we did come to a point where you had to have your three month scan again. Maybe you want to say a little bit about this word that we've learned together, scanxiety, and a little bit about all the interesting numbers that came out of that scan session in the end of September. Yeah, so a couple of scans as usual, so every three months or so, every 12 or 13 weeks, is, which is how the NHS here in the UK do it. And then you've got this time between then and, and the actual results, which takes time for the uh, the uh, MRI and CT departments to actually process it, because it's not actually the data itself that comes from the scans isn't processed by the oncologist. He interprets what they say, or well, not interprets, he uh, uses what they say. So that is a period where quite a lot of people looking at the Facebook groups you said to have what's called scanxiety, scan anxiety, where you're really worried that something is going to go wrong. And gradually that will be the case for me as well because this drug uh, will not, um, very, very unlikely it'll last forever in the state I'm at in at the moment. So we got to, um, to go to see him and I'd learned a few things before that, that particularly about the uh, how scans uh, have only got a certain resolution in the same way I'm looking into a camera at the moment, that has a resolution, your mobile phone camera has a resolution, so do MRIs and CTs. And these lead down to about a diameter of a couple of millimetres, which sounds pretty small, but as I'm sure you're all aware, there are a lot of cells in our bodies, and a couple of millimetres diameter of a, um, a tumour or anything else in the body is still several billion cells. So it could get to the point where the MRI or CT scan can't see any disease in me, the, the, the technical term for this is no evidence of disease, NED, but there's still a lot of cancerous cells in the body. One hopes not, of course, and that's one of the reasons that chemotherapy is used, which I, I haven't been on, because that will then get down to the point where there's zero cells. So it turns out there are about 30 trillion cells in the body that I can still have several billion cells in my body, cancerous cells, that um, are not visible to the equipment that the modern technology, the, the uh, health services have. Should also point out here that the 
the great news about this scan was that the, the main tumour in my brain, which was 27 millimetres across to start with at the beginning of this year, is down to 3 millimetres across, so still visible. And if you look at the, uh, that's a volume reduction of about 700 times. Less so on the lung one and less so on the liver. They've come down by a factor of two or so. But he did say that the, particularly the lung cancer tumour, the original tumour, the primary tumour, might be um, a what, what, without doing a biopsy, I going inside to my body, it may be a combination of dead and dying cells and some fibrosis. The one that's in my spine and other bones, that may be sclerosis that's replacing the cancer. Uh, again, they can't tell that without actually doing a full biopsy, which of course there's no reason to do at the moment. That's right. So, brilliant news again at the end of September. Um, apart from those interesting numbers that you've just told us about, billions of cells and millimetres, and there were some other interesting numbers at the end of September, some of which related to a thing called Parkrun, which lots of us know about, and others relating to your age. Oh, yeah, so a couple tell of us things, about yeah. those. <laughs> nice way of putting it. Um, yeah, so Parkrun, uh, these are these 5K runs set up by a British guy about 20 years ago, run all over the world. Um, I've been running them for about two and a half years and uh, I've only been running for three years and I've managed at my best time this year, my, albeit on a very flat surface quite close to my home as opposed to some of the hilly park runs I've also done in the past, including one in London a couple of weeks ago which was seriously hilly, uh, so that was good. And then the other thing that's happened in the last um, couple of weeks actually is I, I've hit a, an age where I've decided, at the age of 67 in the UK, pension age actually starts at 66 for my my cohort of people born in the 50s, but I've decided at the age of 67 to reduce my roles to being, um, so I haven't got any executive roles. I only had one executive role. Executive role to me means more commitment than a non-executive role, which I still have several of. So this means from that, so, you know, it means unwinding from stuff. There's all kinds of, it's not all positive, of course, because it means, you know, having to build up. Retirement for all of us is very different. My father retired from being a dentist and stopped work, and for 26 years he had nothing to do with dentistry, apart from occasionally looking in his grandchildren's mouths and making comments on that. But it was, for me, it's, I, I enjoy what I do so much, so I'm going to have some involvement. But I'm actually going away with Lise. Uh, I've been away last week in France with a friend. I'm spending a couple of days in Brussels this week. Um, and, next, and we're going away to South America for six weeks as of this coming weekend, um, traveling. So a sort of holiday of a lifetime back at the end of November. During this time, then, um, my son Matt will be releasing these seven vlogs so that by the time I get back, I'll then be moving on to um, doing some interviewing of the oncologists and other, other people in who hopefully will help you. So I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you very much.